with that said, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1 here in chapter 24. I'm going to give to you verses 1 through 9, move into a review to remind us of what has taken place up to this point, then move on into our study as we're looking at uh, the, uh, past, uh, the pastor, apostle rather, Paul, and uh, as he is standing in this particular place of uh, giving his defense. So beginning at verse 1, Acts chapter 24, reading to verse 9, Luke writes, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain order named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So at this time, Paul has been taken before Felix, who is the governor of Judea. This had, become, uh, this had begun when he had been in, uh, in Jerusalem and he had entered into the temple. His opponents had thought he had brought in a Gentile and that means that he would have been defiling the temple. And this charge provoked a mob to set upon Paul and they beat him, the scripture says, almost to death. When the Roman authorities had seen what was happening, they, they intervened and even after such a severe beating, Paul asked for permission to address the crowd. And when he was granted permission to do so, we saw how he had launched into his defense. And he began his defense by speaking in Hebrew. And at first, the crowd were listening to what he had to say. And, and as they listened closely to him, they continued doing so until he said God had sent him to the Gentiles. Now, when they heard that, the response was immediate. They cried out in anger. They threw dust in the air. They prepared to kill him. So at this point, the Roman commander had ordered him to be taken to the barracks. We saw how the commander thought that he was an Egyptian, one who had provoked rebellion. So in the hope of gaining information, he had prepared Paul for scourging. He was going to torture him. It was at that point that Paul told him that he was a Roman, and that information prompted the commander to release him from his bonds. It also prompted him to call the religious authorities in order that they might further question Paul. So Paul had been brought before the Jewish religious council. Now, as he was there, he had seen that there were Pharisees as well as Sadducees in that council, and that prompted him to cry out that he was being judged over a theological question. He was being judged over the resurrection. As we saw, Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, but Pharisees did, and the response was so violent that the commander feared that they would pull Paul to pieces. And once again, Paul was confined to the barracks for safety reasons. Now, the anger over what was going on and the things that he was doing was so great that a group of men determined that they were going to put him to death. It says in chapter 23, verses 12 and 13, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. Now, I touched on that last hour together. Let me give you a little bit more information about these men, these assassins. When you read your New Testament, you're going to see that there are four groups of people that are mentioned, and they're groups that you who read your, your New Testament, you who read the Gospels, you know that there are four groups there mentioned. They're the Pharisees, they're the Sadducees, there's Herodians, and then there's another group that is mentioned, and they're called the Zealots. Now, Zealots believed in violent revolution against Romans. They were completely opposed to foreign oppressors, 
whom they believed was polluting the land of Israel. The Jewish historian, a man by the name of Josephus, said of them, they have an unbreakable attachment to liberty, say that God is their only ruler and Lord, and are not afraid of dying, and are not moved by the deaths of their relations and their friends. They were the zealots. And as a group, they were willing to not only rebel against the Romans, but to assassinate them. Now, it's interesting to note that one of Jesus' 12 apostles is named Simon the Zealot. That gives us some insight. The fact that Jesus also called Matthew shows us something of the power of God to reconcile enemies. Because Simon the Zealot was in favor of violent revolution, and Matthew would have been one of his victims, because Matthew was a publican who worked for the Roman government. And so, what is it that enables us to have uh, a relationship with somebody that we hate? The blood of Christ that covers all sin, and the peace of God that comes upon us, unites us and no longer are we going to be victims of our own philosophy as it relates to how to change the world. And we come to realize that we can have change through the faith that we have in Christ who brings enemies together. And that was what took place with Simon the Zealot and Matthew, a publican. Now, the Zealots, again, are identified as assassins. One com commentator spoke of them as being a splinter group of the Zealots. They are called Sicari. And some of you might be familiar with that word. Sicario, you might be familiar with that word. It speaks of assassins. And that's what they were called. They were dagger men. Sicari speaks of a, a dagger, a short knife that they would conceal. And so if a, a Roman official was near them in a crowd, they would take out the knife and they would kill him. And once again, they would take off. They were the Sicari. And these assassins were violently opposed to the Romans. And so they were the zealots. And that's the group of assassins that determined to kill Paul. Now, this conspiracy, the news of the conspiracy, conspiracy had reached the ears of the nephew of the apostle Paul. And he had gone and spoken to Paul and told him about it. So Paul had him speak to the military commander in charge of guarding him. And the commander assembled 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Now, these military personnel escorted Paul to a place called Caesarea. They're on the northwest coast of, uh, of Israel. And uh, they left him there, and they went to Antipatris, a journey of around 42 miles. The soldiers returned, but the next day, 70 horsemen continued northwest, and the Roman commander had sent Governor Felix a letter. It was outlining the problem. Upon reading the letter, Felix determined to hear the case. Now, as far as the commander was concerned, we saw that he considered Paul innocent of the civil charges. So when the letter was delivered to the governor, Felix, he took the case. He then determined to wait until the Jewish authorities arrived in order that they might confront Paul. And that's what we're seeing take place here. You see, in verse 1 of chapter 24, it says, After five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the, the elders and a certain order named Turtleus. His name was Turtleus because he walked very slow. Anyway, these, I'm just kidding. It's a writing down, he walked slowly. No. Now, these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And so, Ananias had journeyed 70 miles from Jerusalem. He wanted to confront Paul. He wanted to confront his teachings. He came with a man named Tertullus who was a, a lawyer. He's a professional speaker. And what we're seeing is the opening statement. And in this opening statement, he's laying out charges against the Apostle Paul. Now, the name Tertullus is a Roman name. It may infer that he was an expert in Roman law. One thing we know about him for sure is he's an unjust man, and he's representing those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. You see, they were especially upset because Paul was not only preaching a message, but he was preaching this message to both Jew and Gentile. And they hated the idea that Paul would be giving Gentiles hope in the God of Israel. 
Now, Paul wrote a letter to one of the churches that he planted, the Thessalonians, and this is what he said to them in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 through 16. He said, For you brothers became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. He went on to say the wrath of God has come upon them at last. So they hated the idea that Paul was preaching a message, but especially that he was preaching to Gentiles. Now Ananias, Tertullus, and the elders were unwilling to hear the claims of the gospel. They were spiritually blind and willingly were rejecting the word of God. In 2 Corinthians, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, again, another Gentile church, in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, he spoke of it this way. He said, their minds are blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. You could read the scriptures to the Jewish person, and he is blind, and that's what Paul is saying. It takes the Holy Spirit to convict to draw someone to salvation. And so when the law is being read and he's pointing that out, he said they're rejecting them, willfully rejecting what God's word has to say. And he said the veil is only going to be taken away when they come to faith in Christ. Well, as he's speaking here, verse 2, it says, when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation saying that though you were, uh, through you, we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always then in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. So he begins by using flattery, which is a common way of approaching a politician. Tell him, you are the best who's ever lived. We love you so much. And that's what he's doing. In Proverbs 29, verse 5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a, a net for his feet. And that's what he's doing. He's setting a net. He's trying to entrap him so that he'll judge against Paul. He begins by flattery. Notice he begins by saying Felix has promoted great peace and and prosperity. In other other words, under his rule, violence and lawlessness has slightly decreased. Now, his actual intent is to accuse Paul of disturbing that peace. And that's where he's going with this in verse 4. He says, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we, he now gives the, uh, the charges, for we have found this man a plague, creator of dissension among all Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple and we seized him And wanted to judge him according to our law. And so he begins now to lay out the charges. He's leveling three basic charges. First notice how he says, we found this man a plague. He's a creator of dissension. So what he's charging Paul with initially is subversion, sedition. Which is a direct violation of Roman law. In other words, he's saying he's a, he's a troublemaker causing problems throughout the Roman world. And he's done it not only throughout the world, but he's also done it here in Israel. And an earlier occasion in chapter 17, at verse 6, it says, When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And so they're saying, this is a man who is behind all of the problems that the Roman world is having. Now, he had just said, Felix, you protect our peace. But he's also saying, Paul is undermining the peace that you have protected. Well, that's just not true. Believers do not rebel against proper authority. In in general, Christians Christians are the best best, uh, citizens because we ought to be. Remember Romans 13, 1 and 2. uh, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, 
Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So Christians are normally and generally the best citizens in that nation. So what he's saying here is just not true. A second thing he speaks of him as being a ringleader, a ringleader of the sect, he says, of the Nazarenes. Now, in the, the world, believers are called believers, obviously. We're also called Christians. But in the world, uh, they could be called believers or Christians. But in Israel, they were referred to as Nazarenes. And the word Nazarene is a, a word that is used to reveal their lack of value. So they're considered renegade troublemakers as well as heretics. Now, why did they call them Nazarenes? They called them that because Nazarene refers to the hometown of Jesus. In Matthew 2.23, it says, He came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And so he hoped to capitalize on negative images that the Nazarene, or the word Nazarene, created. So to be identified in this fashion is to be portrayed as one who causes problems or a troublemaker. Notice how he calls Paul a ringleader when he's referred to in this way that speaks about him being prominent, the prominent one in, in, in extending the message of this gospel. So, Paul was not an insurrectionist, but Paul certainly was passionate. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, he says to the, another, another Gentile church, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It reminds me of Popeye. I am what I am. That's all that I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I was passionate. I labored. I labored more abundantly. So yes, it's true. He is a leader. He could be referred to in their way as a ringleader. But he was very prominent in extending the message of the gospel. But the inference is that they are heretical. They're non-orthodox. And people believe that to be true. And because people began to believe that Christians could cause problems, Paul was guilty by association. We need to remember that people often listen to half-truths, and they can be influenced by the stereotypes. Sometimes when they've met you, I've had this happen in my life, and perhaps it's happened in yours, you perhaps have had a conversation with somebody you work with, a neighbor, or, or somebody um, that you came into, into contact with, and they will tell you, I've had it said to me, you know, I normally don't like Christians, but you're okay. What's that mean? Well, it means that they've had a bad experience with somebody, and so from that one bad experience, and perhaps it wasn't even the fault of the person they had the experience with, they were turned off. Then they meet somebody like you who has a gentler spirit, perhaps, or not so confrontational, whatever, and, they, and they'll say that. They've said it to me. I, I've met you know, believers. I don't like them normally, but you're okay. Well, people have a tendency of associating through stereotypes and all, and they'll listen to half-truths and think everybody is the same way, and that's kind of what he's doing here. He goes on and gives a third charge. He, verse 6, he tried to profane the temple. We seized him, and we wanted to judge him according to our law. So the third thing in his charge is that, Paul, is that Paul disregards other people's religious rights. The charge is especially serious because he's charging Paul for inciting a riot. And that accusation that he brought was that he brought a Gentile into the temple. And so he's saying in verse 6 that we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. In other words, we, we actually uh, had a, a, a legal arrest. So at this point, he's trying to present the overreaction as reasonable. We seized him. We wanted to judge him according to the law. We were going to give him a fair trial is the inference there. But what happens, verse 7, but the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands. So it's now their fault, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. The Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So he's inferring that Paul would have been given a just hearing, and he's ignoring the violence they perpetrated against him. 
And he falsely accuses Lysias of violence when it was they who tried to kill Paul. Acts 23, 27 says Lysias had said that Paul was about to be killed by the Jews. So in fact, Lysias had to intervene to rescue Paul from their hands. And so as he says this and he's presented his case, verse 10, Paul, then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd either in the synagogues or in the city nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me but as I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they, have, if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless... It is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. Paul doesn't use any flattery, notice that. He states the simple truth. He begins by saying, Felix, you have served as a judge for many years. That makes you experienced. This can give me confidence that you'll be fair and impartial as you listen. So, verse 11 says, it's been no more than 12 days. The events are all recent. It would be easy to find witnesses. They could verify that I came to worship. I wasn't disputing, and I wasn't inciting a riot. So in doing that, or saying this, this is an answer to the first charge, one of creating dissension. My accusers can't substantiate any of the charges they are leveling against me. But he goes on in verse 14, and he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Now this is a denial of the second charge, that of being a ringleader of a heretical sect. He's saying, My faith is strong. It's as firm and full as that of any Pharisee. My faith, he's saying, is settled on what has been taught in the law of Moses and the prophets. Because these scriptures, he's saying, pointed to Jesus, and I trust their authority. Now, Jesus, in John 5, 39, had said this. He said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. Jesus pointed to the scriptures, the Old Testament, and as we've studied through Scripture, and we've mentioned on several occasions, we especially remind ourselves on Christmas and Easter, there are over 300 specific prophecies found in the Old Testament related to Messiah, from his birth to his death and his resurrection. And so Jesus pointed to the Scriptures so that he might be able to present himself as the one who fulfilled it. And Paul is doing the same kind of thing. He's saying, this is what the Scriptures have foretold. This is what it says. He says, believing all things, verse 14, all things which are written in the law and the prophets. He goes on to say in verse 15, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection. Notice of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. The word hope speaks of a confident expectation. I have a confident expectation in God for the resurrection of the dead. Now that reveals that he's addressing Pharisees who are there present. This is something the Pharisees themselves also believe in. Again, verse 15 says there will be a resurrection, notice, of the dead, both of the just 
and the unjust. So Paul is identifying, and I'm going to spend a few moments on this, two classes of people resurrected. He refers to the just and the unjust. As Christians, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. And we believe also that God is the righteous judge of the earth. In Psalm 7, verse 11, it says, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. In Ecclesiastes 14, verse 14, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Every secret thing. I may be able to hide some things from you or from my family, from my wife or those who closely know me. They know me the best. But I can never hide from the eyes of God. God sees not only what I do, but the Word of God teaches us He knows the motives of our heart also. And even when I may do something that appears to be good to somebody else, God sees why I did that. So he's speaking about a righteous judge who will judge righteously and because God is just, he will deliver perfect justice. And what will acquit this righteousness and this righteous judge, what is going to acquit his character and his justice will be that he is righteous and he judges those who have come to faith in him and those who have rejected him. And there's a resurrection that demonstrates how righteous his judgment will be. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 12, in the Old Testament, Daniel said, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There will be those who awaken in the likeness of God, the psalmist said, and they're the ones who enter into the joy of the Lord. Because they have given their faith to God. In the New Testament sense, they have given their faith to God through Christ. And so that is called the resurrection of the just. We have been just and we've been justified by the one who is just. We have received the forgiveness of sin and God has cleansed us with the blood of Christ. And, and all sins have departed. They've been washed away and cleansed. And therefore, we have been made just before him. There are others, though, who have never had that experience, and that's what Paul is pointing to when he speaks of those who are the, the unjust. In John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Notice how he speaks of those who have done good, that they are resurrected to the resurrection of life. Now, that's not saying that they've been good people and that their good works qualify them for resurrection of the just. When it speaks of those who have done good, it speaks of the moral quality of their lives, which has been revealed by their faith in him. Their awareness of ultimate and righteous justice has provoked them and has provoked us to live in a proper way. And this understanding of justice and standing before the judge not only informs my, my, my way of thinking, but it compels my behavior. Uh, it's this knowledge of, of the judgment, the resurrection of the just and the unjust that makes me who I am. It, it, it has produced my values. It helps to determine my behavior towards other people. This knowledge fuels love for others because we have been commanded to love others. It causes us to treat others kindly, to do good to them, to live a holy life. And we know that there's going to be a final accounting that will take place. And, and that's one of the reasons we share the gospel with those who don't know the Lord. Romans 14, 12 says, then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. And that's what drives us to share the gospel. That's what caused me when I first got saved to tell my friends. That's what caused me to tell my, my, my family, my father, my mom, my, my sisters, my brother. That's why I did that. Because I told them, you're going to stand before God. We live in a time when people don't believe that anymore, by the way. We live in a day when people think everybody goes to heaven. All you have to do to go to heaven is die. But that's not what Scripture teaches. We're going to stand before the Lord in judgment. According to Romans 14, 12, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. 
That's what caused me to, to evangelize, to, to, to share with my, with my children. And that's what makes me live in the way that I do in front of my grandchildren. I want them, I want them to go to heaven. I, I want them to know the God of glory. I want them to know how good God is. I, I want them to have his pleasure all their lives. I, I want them to have joy and, and I want them to have peace and I want them to have hope and I don't want them living in fear and I, I don't want them concerned over things that don't matter. You know, and it, it's a knowledge that one day all will stand before God. All will give an account of themselves. For the believer, we receive rewards because our judgment was, was taken upon himself by, by Jesus himself. And therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, we, we receive the righteousness of God because he has imputed unto us a righteousness we didn't have. And, and he has forgiven us for our unrighteous deeds, our actions, our life. And he's given us a new nature. That's the gospel. And, and that's why we preach, guys. That's why we tell people. It's not because we think we're better than somebody else. It's because we love other people. And we want them to go to heaven. That's why we do it. Uh, we need to understand that. Because we're living in a time today, especially so. When people call us all kinds of names for believing the things that we do, when in fact it's our love for others that causes us, and it caused the Apostle Paul to share about the goodness of Christ, and that's what drives us to share with others. So he says in verse 16, this being so, I myself always strive to have a, a conscience without offense toward God and men. I have a personal discipline toward godliness, uh, I'm aware of a resurrection, the resurrection of the just, and, and this has propelled my way of life. It, it's what fueled him to live righteously and properly before God and man. It, it was this fear of God that caused him to, to strive to have a clean conscience. And it's precisely this way of thinking that unbelievers do not possess. In Romans 3.18, speaking of the ungodly, there is no fear of God before their eyes. You see, when you don't believe that there's a judge in judgment, you can live any way you want because you don't fear that you're going to stand before this judge. And it's this way of thinking that allows evil to be perpetrated without conscience. You see, evil, according to Scripture, is the essence of human nature. That's why we need a new nature. It's a belief in God, the God of the Bible, and the care for others that provokes and makes it possible for good to exist. And Paul strove to have a clean conscience. He lived a spiritually disciplined life. That's what he's saying. It's something he disciplined himself towards. In 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he had said, reject profane and old wives' fables. Exercise yourself to godliness. Bodily exercise profits a little. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So the result of believing is that we have hope in life. And we die in hope. Proverbs 14, 32 says, The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous has hope in his death. And this hope is fueled by the promises of God of the resurrection of the just. We'll see his face in righteousness we shall be satisfied when we awaken in his likeness. Now in verse 17, he goes on and says, After many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. He was bringing an offering for the suffering church in Jerusalem. And that's the purpose he was there for. But as this took place in the midst, verse 18, of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult, now, they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged by you this day. So once again, he emphasizes he hadn't been causing any disturbances. He wasn't polluting the temple. He didn't cause a disturbance there. 
He wasn't gathering a crowd. He was engaged in completing the observance of a vow that he had taken. Now if they have a charge, they should be there presenting it, but there are no eyewitnesses. They ought to have been here to object. So where are they? Why aren't they bringing their charge? So you who are here, verse 20, make your charge, prove it. Now, unless, verse 21, it's for this one statement, are you charging me with error for preaching that there's a resurrection? Now, if this is a crime, shouldn't you also be charging the Pharisees? So you see, it's interesting how the first defended me, they at first defended me, but now they're charging me. So that fact of the resurrection isn't a crime. It's not a crime to hold a religious belief. Now, as he's sharing that, verse 22, and we'll move to verse 27 and move to conclude. When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I'll make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was, was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. And meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often, conversed with him, but after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. That's right. <laughs> Are you charging me with error for preaching that there's a resurrection? Well, instead of making the decision, he postpones it. You see, Felix had heard these things, and he had a more accurate knowledge of the way. In other words, he knew that Paul was not a leader of sedition. He had become somewhat familiar, not completely, but somewhat familiar with Christian doctrine. Remember that, that Christianity had been evangelized for 25 years. So he'd be familiar with some of it. What he wants to do is he wants to gain more information on the charges, so in verse 23, he commands the centurion to keep Paul, but he let him have liberty, which reveals that Paul was, rather that Felix wasn't convinced of the charges. Well, in verse 24, notice how it says, after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. I want to spend some time developing this as we, as we come to a conclusion of this chapter. Okay, Felix's name was Marcus Antonius Felix. He was not Jewish. When you do a little history search on him, he was from Cilicia and he was a freed slave. His wife was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa, who is mentioned in chapter 12, and his wife was Jewish. Drusilla was Felix's third wife. Well, in her teens... She had been given in marriage to a king in a region called Emesa, which is in Syria. It's written that she was so beautiful that Felix stole her from her husband. And at age 16, she bore him a son. At this time, she was not yet 20 years of age. And so she could give him some more information from a Jewish perspective. That's why we see that she's referred to as a Jew. Now, I want you to see what's going on here. Verse 25. As he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. When he started to speak to him concerning God's commands and absolute truths, he spoke to him in these three things, righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Righteousness speaks concerning God's absolute standards. Self-control refers to man's response in order that they might come in line with God's standards. And judgment speaks of the result of failing to obey what God has commanded. He's speaking to a man 
who stole his wife from another man. And he's giving him a very clear declaration of the gospel. It reminds me of how John the Baptist spoke to Herod and said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And that cost him his head. So there's a cost for preaching righteousness. And Paul was willing to pay that price. He's speaking to a man who stole a woman from somebody else. And that's why he's speaking concerning righteousness. He's also speaking of self-control. You should have and could have, but did not exercise self-control. Why? Because you are a slave to your passions. And because you have power, you feel that you can take whatever it is you want with nothing ever to, to, that to pay for. And so he's speaking in a very direct way to this man. And then he says, you're not getting away with it. There are so many people who think that they can live in certain ways and get away with it. You never get away with it. And if you think you are, it's because very often that God is extending his grace to you to give you space to repent. But ultimately what happens is judgment will come. So he's telling them, God has absolute righteous standards, Felix. He's saying, you don't exercise self-control because you take what you want, but you need to know that because God has absolute standards you have violated, and because you have no control over your own being, because you don't have the power of God to be able to exercise self-control, you stand in danger of coming judgment. In saying this to him, Felix was afraid. But I want you to see his response. In verse 25, go away for now, when I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Meanwhile, he also, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. So he sent to him more often and conversed with him. After two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the, the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. The response of fear. Notice he said, when I have a convenient time. This is a picture of a lost opportunity. This man stood listening to the greatest evangelist this world has ever seen, the most articulate representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul. He had many sessions and occurrences, opportunities, over and over and over again to hear of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He had the opportunity to hear and to ask questions. And yet, after all these this time, two years, the only thing motivating him was, I want a bribe. I want money. He was hoping that Paul would grow tired and bribe his way out of the charge. He was thinking that money would set him free. And so he had two years of listening to the greatest evangelist, but instead of heavenly riches, all he wanted was earthly treasures. I have seen, and I have to be quick about this, I have seen older men, older men, and I'm not talking about older as in 40 or 50, because I used to think that was old. When our church was young, we had our ministry to the old people. It was called the over 40s. Now that's my youth group. So we, <laughs> when our church was young, the future's out there somewhere, right? When you're young. But you'll be surprised how fast the future is upon you and it's then called your present. And at a certain point, you start looking at the past as the good old days. He thought that he had time. All of us in this room think we do. Every one of us. I've got time. I'll hear you in a more convenient time. I've got things I need to do, things I haven't done, places I haven't gone. When I first was, when I was a kid and I'm 16 years old, I, I still remember this vividly. I was in Newport. I was laying on the beach. A friend of mine named Bill and I were there just catching some rays. And here comes a Jesus freak. <laughs> 
And he, he says, guys, can I talk to you for a moment? I remember I was just laying there looking up, catching some rays. I said, sure, why not? And I was always polite to these people. I didn't know what he wanted. Can I talk to you boys for a minute? You guys for a minute? I said, yes. He said, I wanted to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ and how Jesus died on the cross for you. And I'm just laying there thinking, are you kidding me? This is not an appropriate place to talk to me about God and righteousness and things like that. Can't you see? There are bikinis everywhere. Why are you trying to take my eyes off of that? I really did that. I really thought, I said, man, look at these girls here. You want to talk to me about holy things? I'm not thinking holy thoughts. Why are you doing that to me? But I was polite. I just kind of nodded at him. I said, yeah. I told him, I'm, you, know, you know, I was Catholic. I'm Catholic. And yeah, I know what you're talking about, this and that. I was trying to, and he stayed there for a few minutes, and I finally brushed him off. I said, I want to hear this. You know why? Because this is what I honestly believed. Some of you may identify with this. I believed that I would outgrow my sin. I believed that one day I would grow older, get tired of the things that I was desiring. I would settle down. I wouldn't do drugs anymore. I wouldn't do alcohol anymore. I'd marry a woman. I'd uh, let her take the kids to church while I mowed the lawn on Sundays and drank a beer. That's like my dad. That's what I was going to do. And, and, and I, I thought that would, that would be good enough, that, that God somehow was going to grade on a curve, and if I was better than the average person, I had a chance. And that was pretty much it. You think that your future is settled. And when I started learning, it's not. And I won't go into this in detail. I have done it before. But when I, I turned the corner from that, like your future is settled, when I started seeing friends of mine die at early ages. When you're seeing somebody 17 years old, 18 years old, 19 years old, being stabbed to death or shot in the head or killed in a motorcycle accident, or when you start seeing things like that and you start burying friends, some of you know what I mean. When you start burying friends, you start thinking, I'm not guaranteed. I don't have time. I could die. I had several close calls, like many of you, drug overdoses. We were on the freeway. I was loaded on reds. A friend of mine was driving. We were in a Mustang, 66 Mustang Fastback. A car hit us from behind that was estimated to be going over 90 miles an hour. Lifted up the rear of this Mustang, shot across the lane. We're on the 5 freeway going towards, uh, going south towards, uh, coming out of Hollywood, going towards Norwalk. Lifted the car, shot across three lanes, shot across again, hobbled to the side of the road. I... I landed underneath the, the footwell there. I was sitting shotgun, and I started screaming that I'm blind. I can't see. I'm blind. I can't see. And my friend said, uh, that's because your glasses fell into the back, and they handed me my glasses, and I was miraculously healed. <laughs> it was things like that that began awakening somebody like me to the fact that tomorrow is promised to no one. He was asking for a more convenient time. But he didn't realize that now is the convenient time. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, he says, In the time of my favor I heard you. In the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you this. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. It's not a more convenient time. Your time is always now. And so he put off what he could have had because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. What will a man give in exchange for his soul. He was willing to exchange his soul for the chance that he might get a little bit of money. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that I'm selling my soul for? And what is the more convenient time? If that time isn't right now, then when is it? We have to ask ourselves that.